Um, I'm going to give people just another couple of minutes to, or another minute or so to log on, and I'll go ahead and get my slideshow started. Okay. As I said, I'm Executive Director of the Great Lakes Regional Pollution Prevention Roundtable. Thank you for joining us this afternoon or this morning if you're joining us from the West Coast. Um, just some housekeeping details before we get going. Um, presentation slides are available for download on the, um, the Roundtable website at www.glipper.org on the Meetings page. So if you go to the main page and click on Meetings and Webinars, um, and then there's a link to uh, to to webin oh, to webinars at the top of that page, and if you click there on that link, you'll it'll take you to the to the webinar archive page. Um, I'd also like you to re to remind everyone about our upcoming November 18th webinar. Lynn Rubenstein will be providing an overview of the state electronics challenge. Um, that challenge is open to public entities, including K-12 schools, colleges and universities, libraries, and nonprofit organizations. Um, today, I will also be your speaker, as I said. Um, I'd like, I'll give you a little bit of information about me before we get going. Um, I earned my master's in library and information science from the University of Illinois and have over 20 years of experience as an environmental librarian at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. At ISTC, we focus on pollution prevention, process engineering, and emerging environmental technologies. Uh, I have also been Glipper's executive director for two years and have been, in, but have been involved with the organization during my entire tenure at ISTC. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them using the questions pane on the GoToWebinar control panel. There are several places during the presentation where I will pause to take questions and comments. And with that, We'll get going. So first of all, um, just to make sure that we're on the same page, um, I think it would be a good idea to uh, define sustainability. It's a very popular word, um, but it can sometimes be kind of confusing. So I like to think of sustainability as the intersection of practices that are economically viable, environmentally friendly, and socially acceptable. Um, it's known as, also known as the triple bottom line. Um, there, there are lots of other ways to, to illustrate it, but I think this one makes sense. So basically what you want to do is to make sure that your practices to be, uh, to be sustainable are at the center of that little Boolean diagram there. So why is sustainability important? Well, whether you believe in climate change or not, um, you know, whether it's occurring, um, you know, we get, by, by being more sustainable, we get livable cities, we get air we can breathe, we get water we can drink, um, you know, we're creating a better future for our kids, um, you know, we're making the world a better place. So the bottom line really for me is stewardship. Also something to keep in mind is that pollution is, according to Buckminster Fuller, nothing but resources we're not harvesting. We allow them to disperse because we've been ignorant of their value. Um, and that's one of the, I mean, that's the basic tenet of pollution prevention is that it's, pollution is wasteful um, and it's not efficient. And from a business perspective, um, when I teach this, this content to businesses, um, I mean, it, it's about, you know, about uh, about doing business more efficiently. And I think that's something that resonates with librarians also. So before you can get started um, with sustainability, you really need to make sure that your organization's decision makers are on board. If sustainability is already a part of your organizational culture, that should be an easy sell because they're already, they're already doing it. Um, if it isn't, you need to decide if you want to try to make um, to make sustainability a part of the whole community, campus, or organizational culture. And the reason I'm equivocating is because I know that there are public librarians, academic librarians, and special librarians on the call today. Um, so choose whichever word makes the most sense to you. Um, or if you want the library to lead by example. And I'll talk particularly about public libraries um, at the end of, uh, of this 
of this talk um, and how they can be um, sustainability leaders within their community. So senior level buy-in is important. Why is it important? Because they set the tone for the, org the whole organization. Whether you work for a company, a nonprofit, or public library, there's a, there's a senior person or a board that you report to. Um, you know, if you're the director, you're still, you're still responsible to your library board if you're a public librarian. Or if you're the director of a college library, you're responsible to higher-ups in the administration. Um, in order for sustainability to truly become a part of your organization, you need to get buy-in from those people. Um, and like I said, that's for the organization as a whole. Why senior managers set the tone for the organization. They make things happen. If, they, if, if something is important to them, it automatically becomes important to everybody. Their actions, and their actions happen both overtly and behind the scenes. So um, we've all had managers or higher-ups that say one thing in public and do something else in a meeting with their senior managers, um, you know you've got to be aware of both of those, of both of those, uh, those facets. Overt actions include allocation of resources. Um, unstated behind the scenes priorities drive long-term decisions, though. So if you have a manager or a president, a university president, or a director who's saying, "Yeah, sustainability is great." but they're not willing to give you money or people to make it happen, then they're probably not on board. So senior management attention is often hard to get because senior managers are generally crisis driven. Um, this is true in business and I, it's also true in, in nonprofit organizations, libraries and universities. Um, the amount of senior management attention available to any single effort, such as sustainability, is often small. That's why they're senior managers and they have people working under them to be concerned with, with the day-to-day. -day. Um, return on investment isn't easy, always easy to calculate. Um, particularly in the business world, this is really important. Um, but even, I mean, even if you're a public entity, you're still stewarding the public's, the public's dollars. And it's difficult to get commitment when the results are unclear. Um, you know, from a business perspective, if you can show that a particular process change is going to actually save the company money within a year or maybe or six months, six months is better, um, that's a pretty easy sell. Um, it's a harder sell if it's seen as well that we can use this as you know as public good. Um, I think that's a little maybe a little bit easier sell in the nonprofit and university community, but not always. Senior management often doesn't have a clearly defined role in process management. Um, you know, they're not the people doing the day-to-day -day work generally. Um, they're not the people in the trenches. So that can make it difficult for them to, to understand why it's important to change a process, whatever that process is. And change is often scary for senior managers. Change is really scary for everybody. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about employee engagement in a little bit. But uh, corporate culture often teaches skill and skills, particularly for managers, in face saving and sidestepping. Um, failure is seen as a bad thing. Um, needed change can be embarrassing or threatening, um, so some managers learn to sidestep and delay in order to save face. Um, I'm sure we've all had managers like that. I know I have. They can be convinced if you get their attention. Um, in again, in the business world, you know, waste is a defect. So if you've got an organization that's committed to the total quality management principles, um, you know. That's that can be a selling point. Um, the other the other argument is that waste is costing you money. If you can figure out, you know, how how much your energy use or your water use would would decline if you if you implemented a particular project, and that saves them money, that gets their attention. So so. Leading into that, show the return on investment. Waste is costly. Cost is generally uh, of waste is generally underestimated. Um, allocating costs to particular departments rather than the 
the uh, ever so popular overhead, places charges for waste with business with with the u the business units responsible for that waste. Um, for example, the University of Illinois. Oh, it's been four or five years ago now, maybe a little longer than that. Um, changed the way that they build energy use on campus instead of um, just having it be an, an, an overall campus cost, they started billing billing the departments based on space allocations um, and, and divvied it up that way. And that changed the way a lot of departments did business, including the library. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, convince them that they have a clearly defined role. Um, you know, eliminating waste is resource efficient clearly, um, but if you can get your senior management to be your cheerleaders, both in word and deed, that's a really powerful thing to have. So, but you have to explain to them how they can do that. Make the change less scary. You know, show them what it's costing them to do business as usual. Um, that's what the university did with, with the energy use. Um, you know, the cost of business as usual, you're ignoring continuous improvement and innovation opportunities. Um, you're lowering your competitive advantage, which is important in business. Um, that can also, as, as we run universities and public institutions, more like businesses, that could also, could also be used. Um, potential liability is also a concern. Um, not, I mean, and that's not just a business concern because, um, you know, public entities have to, uh, like libraries have to comply with um, health and safety regulations. So um, reducing, you know, the toxics that you're using in your building um, when it comes to cleaners and, and other chemicals, um, that that lowers your your public your environmental compliance costs. Um, it may also lower worker compensation costs. Um, there are also public relations costs. Um, you know, it's it's really obvious when a business um, does something that, that damages the environment, you know, if there's a big spill or something like that. But even, I mean, even for public entities, that's, there's, there's a cost. And especially if you're talking about efficiency and stewardship of tax dollars, um, I think that that's part of the cost is, you know, you're, you, need, you're, you need to show that you're good stewards of the public's money. And then you could so address potential hurdles that also makes the change less scary. And then compare direct and indirect costs of current practices versus the the direct and indirect costs if improvements are made. So you know they're committed when they establish a common vision of an improved organization. Encourage other managers to take the projects the process seriously. Support the group in word and deed. That means they don't just say it. They give you people and they give you money if you need money to do that. And they give you, they give you the authority to make changes. Again, provide resources. And then actively address organizational incompetence. So they don't let others get away with sidestepping or saying, ah, I don't know if that's, you know, we tried that 10 years ago. I don't think that's going to work. Um, encourage, they encourage experimentation um, and understand that not every project is going to be 100% successful. Um, you know, make it okay, make it, make it a safe place to fail and learn from the experience. Um, they reward innovation and then again, turn failures into learning experiences because a failure is only a failure if you don't learn something from it. You also need to engage employees, and there are four stages of engagement um, when it comes to, well, engaging anybody, but in this case, we're talking about employees. Um, awareness, you need to take them, first of all, first of all, you need to make them aware of the problem, so you, so, and then you need to have them make a connection to their personal lives or their jobs. So you need to have a solid vision and strategy in order to convince people to make the changes, and you need to use multiple communication channels. Um, you can use signage, you can use, um, just, you know, have advocates, I, we're, we're going to talk about green teams in a few minutes, but, uh, you know, have advocates talking about the process and, or the changes and why they're important, um, things like that. So 
then when you once you get them to connection then you need to move them to commitment and the be, one a really good way to do that is to meet people where they are to increase awareness and understanding of sustainability not everybody is going to be ready to stop driving their cars to work and and use bikes or buses and always bring their lunch in reusable containers that's just i mean there's a continuum and you're going to probably have some people who are not who no matter what you do are not going to engage um, but if you can get them to move slowly up that continuum you're you're much better off um, make connections between actions at home and work for example would you leave your lights on all day at home um, I bet a lot of people wouldn't um, unless they're unless they have kids because kids seem just unable to turn that light switch off um, but uh, but they the understanding they at home is that leaving the lights on all day costs them money um, you know if you leave the lights on in your office or in conference rooms or whatever all day when people aren't using them that costs your institution money um, and that's money that you can use to for other things like materials personnel stuff like that it all adds up um, another thing you can do is share best practices you know I mean if you know if there are ways that you can get people to actually do do the things you want them to do you know try try those things out so the next thing the the final phase is moving from commitment to action and you can do that by rewarding involvement you know public recognition for individual ideas or individual effort um, you can foster innovation by letting employees run with their if they have if somebody has an idea letting them run with their idea and then celebrate individual and organizational accomplishments that's really important um, but the thing to remember through all of this is that uh, you need to move people from awareness to action and that as new people arrive this process starts all over again employee engagement is a continuous process so, so in order to be truly successful at engaging employees at every step sustainability really needs to become a part of the organizational culture so at this point, I will stop and see if there are questions. I have somebody who asked me, will you please post link, oh, link to slides so we can cut and paste. Yes, I will do that right now. I will, I will also be sending out a, um, a uh, email at the end of the at, after the webinar concludes with links to the slides um, and uh, and an evaluation and a bunch of other stuff so but I just put the link in the chat box so everybody should see it okay are there any other questions before I keep going Seeing none, I will move on. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the process of developing a sustainability plan. I almost said strategic plan, and the reason I almost said strategic plan is because really the process is very similar. Um, planning is planning. That's one of the things that, that I've learned from teaching from teaching this content for so long. So the first thing that that most that I recommend most organizations do is form a green team because that's a great way to engage employees. So identify personnel in your organization that are familiar with major operations and services. So things like facilities, building management, purchasing, things like that. Um, include people who are enthusiastic about promoting environmental responsible practices in the workplace because really that's I mean those are the people that you want to have pushing really promoting sustainability as the people who are enthusiastic about it that's kind of obvious be creative in your selection good ideas come from everywhere um, so ask for volunteers and include people at all levels and responsibilities if you have student workers or um, you know library pages or, or whatever um, get them involved you know 
a lot of times young, younger, um, young adults are really, really enthusiastic about sustainability in a way that those of us who are a little bit older maybe aren't. Um, but I think it's good to have a mix of ages and a mix of job responsibilities because, you, as I said, you never know where that good idea is going to come from. So correlate the number of people on the team to the size of your staff. If you're from a really, really super small library, um, you know, you, you as director may be the only professional, and you may only have three other staff people. And that, at that point, you know, maybe you get a board member involved, maybe you get one other staff person involved, you know, kind of see. But also, even in large organizations, don't make your green team too big because as we all know, really large committees, the larger the committee, um, the greater a chance that decision making gets bogged down and you don't actually get things done. So choose a coordinator. That coordinator should be an enthusiastic team leader. Um, select one or two lead, one, depending on the size of, again, of the size of your team. Select one or two leaders who are committed to your program. They should, those people should oversee the program and act as a liaison between maintenance staff, management employees, and whoever your, your vendors are if you're doing like recycling or things like that. And ensure that the team has authority to set goals and implement actions to achieve those goals because if they don't, obviously, this is not going to work very well. Um, some other responsibilities of the team include working with management to set the preliminary and long-term goals of the program. Um, that's a really good, good way to get management buy-in. Um, gathering and analyzing information relevant to designing and implementing the program, and then promoting that program to employees and educating them about how they can participate. Um, and monitoring progress of the program because measurement is important. We all know that we don't value what we don't measure. Um, and then periodically report to management about the status of the program and also to your public. So some things, some, one of the first steps that you do, you should do once you form a green team is to set some preliminary goals. So start small. There are a lot of great ideas out there, but don't try to do everything at once. Um, begin your work with simple projects that have a relatively high likelihood of success. This will help you gain additional support and credibility. You can then expand your program little by little. So the next thing you need to do is evaluate your, your baseline impact on the environment. So what operations in libraries, uh, in, in your library, um, have, have an environmental impact? You know, start with broad categories and identify specific processes within those categories. So create, and create a baseline um, of energy and water use. Um, energy Star Portfolio Manager is a really good tool for that. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on in the talk. Um, create a baseline for waste. Um, you know, make sure you think creatively about, about how, how, what waste is generated. Um, not just paper waste, because I know libraries have lots of paper waste, um, but also food waste from events or from employee lunches, um, you know, just anything that might be going out the door and going to the dumpster. Um, purchasing practices, ask yourself, are you buying green products? What products are you buying that contain hazardous chemicals? Um, you, there may be some things beyond, there are probably things beyond cleaning products that, uh, that fit into that category. Um, identify the environmental benefits of your current practices because sh surely you're doing some good stuff. And then discuss barriers to implementing current practices and the ways you can overcome them. But don't look for solutions yet. That comes later in the process. So this is an example of a table you could use for, to, to I call it drawing yourself a picture. So basically, you just break it out by operations, activities, resources, waste, hazardous chemicals, and then the environmental impact. Um, and as I said, this is just an example. So Energy Star Portfolio Manager is a really great tool to, that allows you to track not only your building's energy use, but also water use over time. Um, the for, to get started, you enter baseline data, and then you continue entering data 
each, you know, as you get the as you get the usage statements each month. Um, Portfolio Manager also allows you to create charts and graphs to show your progress, which is really useful. And if you're participating in the Illinois um, Green Office Challenge, I think there might be a few of you signed up for that. Um, using Portfolio Manager as a requirement of the of participating in the program. So the next thing to do is to set goals and indicators. So you need to establish both short and long-term goals. Um, rethink your practices and make yourself stretch. Um, you know, really, really think about what you're currently doing and maybe how you can do it differently so that you're not producing waste in the first place. And I'll, I'll talk about some specific examples of that in a little bit. Um, be realistic, you know, understand the size of your staff, the level of your management commitment, you know, that kind of thing. Ask yourself how you can do things in a more efficient way. And finally, make your goals specific and measurable. That's really key. So instead of having a goal of being reducing energy use in the next year, say we're going to reduce energy use, our, our building energy use by 30% in the next year. The next step, obviously, is to develop project ideas. So compare what you're already doing with your long-term goals. Develop a list of potential projects. Um, I recommend including both large and small projects. So ask yourself, if you were going to do a major building remodel, what are some things you want to do? Or, and, and con that would be the large. And then the small, conversely, is if you had to implement something tomorrow, what would that be? Research what other companies and organizations are doing. Um, there are a lot of libraries who are already pretty heavily involved in, uh, in sustainability. Um, and I, I have developed a Green Libraries LibGuide, the link to which will be in the email that I will send out after, um, after the talk today. Um, and that LibGuide actually has case studies um, for, to show what, what libraries are already working on. And if there's something that's not in there that I've missed, please send, it, send, send me an email and I'm happy to include it. So look at best practices for government agencies. Um, there are a lot of similarities, obviously, between libraries and, and, other, and other government agencies. And the federal government has been doing this for a long time. So there are a lot of really good best practices out there for that. And then brainstorm, and as my fourth grade, my, my daughter's fourth grade teacher used to tell her class, use your resources. Ask for suggestions from everyone. Um, again, you don't know where that good idea is going to come from. It might come from a patron. It might come from, you know, the part-time page. It might come from a volunteer. Um, it might come from your five-year-old. You never know. So once you've got your list of projects, you need to prioritize it. So some things to ask yourself as you're prioritizing the list, will the project have environmental benefits and are those benefits significant? Will the project result in cost savings over the life of the action? If yes, how much? How long will that payback time take? Um, you can calculate simple payback by taking the total cost of the project divided by the annual savings and then that gives you the number of years until payback. Is the time frame and ease of implementation manageable? Um, and then do you have control over the action? Um, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, ISTC recently um, reconstituted their green team and one of the things that they decided was that they were going to, um, any projects that dealt, dealt with the physical building itself, they were going to um, wait on, those were, those were going to be a lower priority. And the reason for that is that the University of Illinois um, Facilities and Services manages our building which means we don't have control over things like HVAC um, and lighting and things like that. Anything that we do to the actual building has to go through facilities and services. And there are quite a few barriers to implementation there. <laughs> so um, so they're, they're trying other things, including um, we started com a composting program and some things like that. Um, but those that are things that are more behavior change oriented that we can do in-house. Um, finally, does the action have high visibility and or educational value? And I think for libraries in particular, this is really important because libraries 
our well, university like college university libraries and public libraries are public buildings. Um, well, they're the college university libraries are public buildings and they're public institutions, which means that you get all members of the general public walking in and out of them every day. Very high usage, very high traffic. Um, that means that any projects that you do, if you publicize them or do programming around them, um, have both high visibility and I think a really, a really high potential for educational value. So finalize the list by giving the highest priority to things that have the most yes answers. That's kind of kind of obvious, I think. So the next the next step in the process is get it done. Um, how do you start to get it done? You break each project down into discrete tasks with me measurable goals when practical, um, because again, if you don't measure it, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, we value what we measure. Um, assign staff and team members that will res be responsible for completing each task. Um, once again, if you have a name associated with a particular task, that task is much more likely to get done because there's accountability. Um, when it's everybody's job, quite often it's nobody's job. Um, identify resources needed to complete the project. Um, those will include possibly financial resources, but also people. Um, maybe new equipment, you know, stuff like that. Define how you're going to track projects. So use specific measure and use specific measurement indicators when you do that. We already went through that. Assign a deadline for completing each task because once again, if it doesn't have a deadline, it's probably not going to be a priority. Um, I know I'm a master at putting things off until the last minute. So if there's no deadline, it's probably not going to happen. Finally, write it down, because writing it down, again, gives you that accountability, and accountability is key. So here's an example of what that might look like. So say your sustainability goal is to increase energy, building energy use by 30%. The measure of your success is lower energy bills. You have specific tasks, including solicit ideas from staff, change to CFL light bulbs, or actually LEDs um, might even be a better choice at this point. Shut down sleep computers at night. Um, set thermostats to reduce energy use during light hours that the library is closed. Um, that's really key and can make a huge difference. Um, encourage staff to turn off the lights when leaving the break room. Um, publicize cost savings. So those are those are just some examples of specific tasks, and you can see there are assigned staff. There's a deadline, um, and then hopefully at, by you know. By December, you'll be able to see, you know, in six months, you'll be able to see measurable energy savings. Hopefully, you'll be able to see measurable energy savings after a month or two. So the next thing you need to do is measure and document. So you need to determine what needs to be measured, how it'll be carried out, how often you're going to do it, and who's going to do it. And then link measurement and monitoring to your overall plan based on whatever your goals are. Um, I have examples there, cost savings, water and energy use, waste generated, et cetera. And then keep it going. So make sustainability a part of your routine decision-making process. And then identify the key decision points and investigate opportunities to sustainability. So some of those key decision points include when products are purchased, when projects are approved in budget meetings, um, you know, are you, are, you factoring, are you factoring sustainability into that? Um, when you're planning for building renovation or construction, obviously that's huge. Um, you know, and maybe one of the questions you want to ask yourself or maybe one of your goals if you're doing renovation or um, construction is we want to meet LEED standards. Um, you don't necessarily have to get LEED certified, but you can use the standards as a benchmark. Um, and then when deciding what to use to evaluate employee performance, if you really want to make it part of your organizational culture, Maybe you have a couple of people whose goals for the, on the next year's performance evaluation are to do something sustainability related, whether it's programming or, you know, making changes, making changes within the, within the library's operations or, or whatever. So some next steps, tell people. 
um, you know, if you if if you're in a special library and you um, your company has a CSR report or a CS a corporate social responsibility website, make sure the library stuff is on there. Publicize it in your newsletter. Um, do programming related to successful projects. Um, and one way that you can do that is to, if, especially if you're implementing a new technology or something like that, show your patrons, do programming to show your patrons how they can do the same things at home. Because that makes that connection then between, oh, look, the library's doing this neat thing, and oh, wait, I can do some stuff in my house to save money, like get my kids to turn the lights off. Now nah, that'll never happen. Another thing you can do if you're, if you're in Illinois is apply for an Illinois Governor Sustainability Award. Um, and basically what that is, it's a recognition program for um, businesses and organizations who are doing sustainability. Um, if you aren't in Illinois, see if your state has a similar program. A lot of states do. Join the Illinois Green Office Challenge. Again, if you're in Illinois and you're in the greater Peoria, Champaign-Urbana, or Bloomington Normal areas, um, we really want to have libraries involved. I think that, I, and I'm really pushing for that. So um, I think most of you are not from Illinois, but that's okay. Um, and also, again, see if if there's if you're not in Illinois, see if there's if there's a similar program in your state or in your in your community. Don't put your plan in a drawer and forget about it. Please, please, please. <laughs> if you take one thing away, that's the thing I want you to take away today. Don't put your plan in a drawer and forget about it. Um, evaluate and revise it based on what works and what doesn't. Um, again, a lot like strategic planning. Um, identify new opportunities. And then ask for assistance. Um, Illinois resources include the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's Technical Assistance Program. Um, the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center at the um, University of Illinois, and the Illinois Green Business Association. So the last step in the planning process is really a caution. You know, think ahead so that your process doesn't get derailed before it even starts. Um, you know, think about what some problems might are that might impede your progress as you proceed down the sustainability track to kind of beat the rail metaphor to death. Um, you know, ask for suggestions. Uh, behavior change is hard. Brainstorm ways, and, and you can, you, you within your green team can brainstorm ways to encourage behavior change. Some examples um, are celebrate your accomplishments, you know, bring treats, do some kind of reward thing. Um, when you meet a goal. And don't just celebrate within the green team. I mean, make a big splash about it to the staff and to your public. Um, give prizes and recognition for people who are going green, you know, bringing lunch from home in usable containers. If you have, have people who bike to work all the time, um, make it easier for them to bike to work. Um, you know, I, I think employee showers would be an excellent idea. Um, I know that's not feasible in a lot of places, but um, you know, do things like that. Bike racks right outside the library. Um, you know, make make sure that you, that that your that your infrastructure is backing up what you're saying. Um, publicize energy and water savings. You can translate that into cars taken off the road, pounds of CO2 prevented. Um, EPA has fact sheets and calculators available. Um, there are links to that to those calculators on the. Um, on the Glipper webinars, the meetings page that I posted the link to a little bit earlier. Um, also, if you're publicizing to your if you're if you're publicizing to your public, <coughs> um, to your patrons, um, translate it into metrics that they understand. So you know we saved X amount of dollars on our utility bill by switching out our light bulbs. That means that we could buy Y number of you know, books, Z number of DVDs, or we at we were able to pay for a part-time staff person. You know, I mean, those kinds of things show that you're being good. You're showing your public that you're being good stewards of their money, and I think that's really, really important. And it's a really good sell for your patrons. So this is the point where I'm going to stop and again ask if there are any questions. And it doesn't look like there are, so I'm going to keep I'm going to keep moving. So the next step, the the next thing I'm going to talk about is easy opportunities. 
You know, what are things that you can, when you get off this webinar, that you can do right now or close to now? Um, and they generally have a pretty quick payback. So energy use is a good place to start. Lighting. Um, you can replace your incandescent bulbs if you still have them, which you really shouldn't, with CFLs or LEDs. Um, you know, replace, you replace your current fluorescent lighting with more efficient fluorescence. Turn off the lights. That's a huge one. Um, you can install motion detectors in the break room, meeting rooms, and bathrooms. Um, and just the backlighting on your vending machines. That's a huge energy suck. Um, upgrade your exit signs. Um, a lot of the, the, the older ones used incandescence. Um, there are now, there are conversion kits available actually to convert those to LEDs. Um, or there are also, there's a whole line of products I think that use phosphorescent. Um, so another thing you can do is program your thermostats or program your HVAC system. Um, you know, I, there, there's a local library that we did some work with at one time that um, had one of our technical assistance engineers do a walkthrough of their building. And one of the things that he discovered is that when they had their new HVAC system installed, they hadn't reprogrammed from the default settings. So at times that the library was closed, they were heating and cooling like it was open. So he reprogrammed that for them to, you know, and, and adjusted the, the settings to, you know, in the winter, lower the temperature when the building's not occupied, you know, in the, in the summer, raise the temperature when the building's not occupied. And it saved them a lot of money really fast. And then, obviously, that's money that you keep saving. Um, shut down or program the power management settings on your staff workstations and public access computers. Um, there's no reason your computers need to sit on all night. Um, you know, if, if your IT is doing um, upgrades at night or, you know, pushing out updates, um, there should be a way for them to configure it so that if a computer is shut down when it's turned back on, the first thing that they do, that it does, is download that update. Um, our, our computers at ISTC are actually configured that way, um, and it's really great because, again, we can shut off the computers. Ask for technical assistance, again, um, talked about ISTC and the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center. Apply for grants. Um, there may be incentives available from your utility provider. Um, Illinois also has the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation, which um, often has grants available for public sector buildings. Good place to go if you're looking for any kind of information at all on energy efficiency is Energy Star. Um, they do buildings, they do plants, they do new homes. I believe they actually have added a section on libraries. Um, so. If you haven't checked them out recently, do it because it's they've got good stuff. Another thing you can do is buy green. Um, it's a lot easier to buy green products than it used to be, um, but you got to be careful because uh, you know not not even just because a company says products green doesn't mean it is. Um, we call that greenwashing. Um, Basically, what that means is that company, a company has spent more time and money claiming to be green than it does actually being green. Um, at best, companies make green claims to sell stuff. At worst, um, it encourages people, it, it makes people more skeptical about, about the products that are out there um, cons because consumers don't know what to believe, and then obviously it can hurt a company's reputation with customers. So I urge you to be a smart consumer. Um, Environmental claims should be specific. You know, look for specific amounts of recycled content, uh, re packaging reductions, that kinds of kind of thing. Um, you know, made from recycled content. Well, okay, how much? Um, some claims are too vague. Also, some claims are too vague to be meaningful. Um, Eco-friendly and environmentally friendly. The, if you see those things, the first question you should be asking is how. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that degradable products don't save landfill space if you throw them in the garbage <laughs> because once things go into a landfill, they degrade very, very slowly because there's no oxygen to help the process along. If you're composting, however, composting turns degradable material into useful, into, into something useful. 
Um, so that's something to think about. So if you're buying, you know, biodegradable products for your um, for your your library events, and those products are getting thrown away, then it's kind of a wash. You're better off using reusables at that point. Um, and then symbols can be useful. Um, everybody knows the recycling symbol, I would hope, at this point. Um, some other green certification symbols to look for are Energy Star, um, Green Seal, EPEAT, and WaterSense. And this is what those symbols look like and what they certify. Um, green Seal certifies lots of stuff. Um, WaterSense certifies water efficient um, products and services. The Forest Stewardship Council focuses on wood and paper products and generally their focus is on whether um, the wood is harvested using sustainable forestry practices. Um, so it doesn't have anything to do with the amount of recycled content in the paper itself. In fact, I encourage you to buy 100% recycled or paper made from 100% recycled fibers if you can. Um, Green Guard is not that new anymore, but it's um, indoor air quality certified um, building materials, furnishings, and finish systems. And I know that there's a lot of Green Guard stuff being sold through Demco and the other library, the other big library suppliers. Um, Energy Star, I think everybody knows Energy Star. They do electronics, they do lighting, you know, electrical, electronic equipment, that kind of thing. And then EPEAT certifies computers. Um, both for energy efficiency and for toxic chemicals and, and things like that, or lack of toxic chemicals. Um, if you run across an eco-label and you don't know what it is, um, you can check out the eco-label index. Um, they have 458 eco-labels listed. Um, they're listed alphabetically by name, and they explain um, where the certification is used, what it covers, and what it doesn't cover. I have one question which is, can ISTC help with statistics data? How much energy is used if a computer stays on versus shut up down? In restarted mode, how much waste do hand dryers eliminate versus how much they cost? Um, that's a good question. Um, I actually do have some resources for that. Um, I don't have them right in front of me at, at this particular moment. But, um, but yes, that is something that absolutely um, we can we can help you track down because a lot of that data is available. Um, my contact information will be on the last slide um, and feel free to email me if you have specific ideas or specific things you want information on. Um, and uh, and I'll you know I'll see what I can pull together. Um, and I and I may um, I have a couple of things actual a, a couple of resources actually in mind that I'll put into the email that I'm sending out later today. Um, another question is, do you work with? Are you involved with ALA Sustainability Roundtable? Yes, I am a member of ALA Sustainability Roundtable. Um, I think it's great. Um, I have not become super involved yet, um, but uh, but I'm I'm keeping an eye on it. And then um, somebody else said they would lead, um, add leaping bunny verification for items that are cruelty free. In other words, not tested on animals. And I don't know that I don't know if that's outside the purview of the Eco Label Index or not. You might um, you might want to check and see if that's on there because that's interesting. Um, and that actually is not uh, one that one that I had run across before. And then somebody else wants to know any suggestions for responsible disposal of microforms. Actually, I was going to get to weeded or weeded materials momentarily, but I will tell you right now that um, that um, companies that recycle X-ray film um, also recycle microform. So because it's the same materials. So um, if you have a local a hot, most places have hospitals in their community. <laughs> um, if you can find out who's picking up their, um, their x-ray film, um, you may be able to make a deal with the recycler to have them swing by the library and pick up your, pick up microform. Um, and that actually, that, that tip actually came from a community college, from um, our, one of our local community college librarians because they had run into that very problem. So, Case studies. I'm going to talk about paper and I'm going to talk about electronics. Um, 
So first of all, some paper facts. Purchase price is just the tip of the paper iceberg. For each sheet of paper per purchased, companies must also pay for storage, copying, printing, postage, disposal, and recycling. A recent Minnesota study estimates that associated paper costs could be as much as 31 times the purchasing cost. That does not include labor. A ream of paper that you pay $5 for really could cost $155. That's kind of sobering. Citigroup determined that if each employee used double-sided copying to conserve just one sheet of paper each week, the firm would save $70,000 or $700,000 a year. Um, Citigroup is really big, but and that's kind of a big number, but you know what? Every little bit helps. So, you know, double-sided copying is, is definitely a good way to go. Bank of America cut its paper consumption by 25% in two years by increasing the use of its online forms and reports, email, double-sided copying, and lighter weight paper. Um, paper has a large environmental footprint. It takes more than a cup and a half of water to make one sheet of paper. Um, cup and a half is equal to one soda can. Um, so one soda can to manufacture one sheet of paper. Um, over 40% of wood pulp goes toward the production of paper. And reducing paper use reduces greenhouse gases. 40 reams of paper is like 1.5 acres of pine forest absorbing carbon for a year. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that thermal paper, you know, the stuff in receipt printers, is often coated with unbound bisphenol A. Um, basically, what unbound means is that it wipes off onto hands very easily. Um, BPA is, has been in the news the last couple of years because it was, it's also something that's found in soft plastics um, and uh, it leaches into liquids when it's used for like baby bottles or water bottles or so, but it is a reproductive, developmental, and systemic toxicant in animal studies. Um, BPA-free thermal paper really isn't a lot better because it's usually coated with different chemical which isn't really any safer or more environmentally friendly than BPA. So to ensure the health and safety of library workers and pat patrons, minimize contact with thermal receipt paper. That's the bottom line. So rethink your paper use. Um, print only when necessary. Go electronic. Um, you know, if you're worried about, if you're worried about BPA and paper, um, you can send circulation receipts via email or offer a receipt free option. Um, you know, and there are also printers, there are also plain paper receipt printers, um, which, you know, if, if you can switch that out economically, that might be something to do. Um, use fax post-its rather than a cover sheet. Um, I don't know how many people fax, even fax anymore. Um, I don't very often. Um, duplex instead of printing on one side, um, if you have printers that will do so. Um, use the back side of single sheets of scratch paper. Um, I know a lot of libraries do that. Recycle. Um, purchase paper with post-consumer recycled content of 30% or higher. 100% um, is, be is best, obviously. Um, and start an office paper recycling program if you don't already have one, although at this point I think most larger libraries are already doing that. So yay for us. So some, some suggestions for weeded material. Um, you know, book sales, book giveaways to community organizations. Um, you can partner with Better World Books or um, B Logistics to, um, to get rid of weeded materials also. Um, sell them on Amazon, Half.com, or eBay, um, particularly if you have gift books or books that you're weeding that are rare or somehow valuable. Um, Sell, donate, or recycle CDs and DVDs. And then, as I said um, earlier, microform can be recycled by companies that take, take x-ray film. So um, if you can find, if, if you can figure out, you know, if there's, not, if there's not a company in your community that recycles x-ray film, find out where your local hospital or your local medical clinics recycle theirs. Um, and call that vendor and see if they're willing to make a stop. Um, I know in Champaign-Urbana, um, the vendor comes down from Chicago, I think, about once a month to pick up from the local hospitals. So, um, so it's it's easy for him to add add library stops. Um, Eco-friendly electronics isn't an oxymoron. 
Some ways to buy greener electronics include buying with energy in mind, so look for the Energy Star label. Buy used or refurbished. Um, look for EPEAT standards. And then buy less toxic. Um, again, using um, EPEAT has a, e, the EPEAT website has a buyer's guide, um, and they also have um, you know they they also have have information have really detailed information on on com, on computer manufacturers. So think before you throw it away. Electronic devices are a complex mixture of several hundred materials. Many of them. Many of them also contain toxic heavy metals and hazardous chemicals, so don't throw them away. Um, it is illegal in Illinois and in, I think I counted this morning, about 20 other states. Um, you can check to see if your state has a ban. Um, that link is, again, on, is on the uh, Glipper website also. Um, you know, a lot of manufacturers and retailers have take-back programs now, um, so it's pretty easy to, to make sure that, that, it's, that, your, that your electronics are being um, disposed of responsibly. Um, you can donate to schools, community organizations, or vocational programs. Um, or if you're, you work for a state institution that, and you have to follow, obviously, state procurement law. Um, that's one thing that, actually, that ISTC has actually been working with um, Illinois' um, Department of Central Management Services to find ways to make it easier to donate used computers that have come out of state agencies. Um, and then for, for public libraries, um, TechSoup has a refurbished computer initiative. Um, TechSoup is, a, um, is an organization that provides low-cost software to nonprofit agencies, including libraries. Um, they offer refurbished computers um, to nonprofits at a reduced rate. That means that libraries could get refurbished computers at a reduced rate from TechSoup. But it's also, if you're replacing, say, all of your public access terminals at once, and you have all these computers and you don't know what to do with them, um, you could maybe get, you could contact TechSoup and see if they, they're will, if they want to take those. So two places you can learn more, um, the State Electronics Challenge. Um, I, as I mentioned, we have a webinar coming up on November 18th. Um, which is an introduction to the State Electronics Challenge. All public entities are welcome to participate. In the, in the challenge, um, that includes schools, nonprofits, libraries. Um, and then the Sustainable Electronics Initiative, which is, which is an initiative of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, um, is also a great information resource. And again, these links are on, are on the Glipper website, along with the, the links to the slides. And I'll be sending those links out at the end. Finally, um, we're going to talk very briefly about becoming a community leader in sustainability. Um, and a lot of this is targeted at public libraries, but I think there are things that, um, that college and university libraries and special libraries can take away from this too. Um, you know, try doing some local initiatives. Establish relationships with local environmental groups. Um, partner with them for library projects. For example, say you want to um, make your landscaping more, more environmentally friendly um, by planting native plants. Work with your local master gardeners group um, to, to have them help you figure out what plants to plant and, and maybe actually have them do the work. Um, you can start a tool lending library, a local seed repository for heirloom plants, or be a local drop-off for batteries, electronics, or sneaker recycling. I know the libraries are doing all of those things. Um, Tool lending libraries actually go along with the whole maker movement also in public libraries. And then publicize the library sustainability projects. If you already have a green building, for example, use the green technology features in that building as a springboard for educating your patrons about how those technologies work and can be applied at home. For example, say you've done, you've built a new building and you've installed a geothermal system. Have information available in a prominent location about how geothermal energy works. Maybe bring in a local contractor who does, um, who installs geothermal systems in, in, in homes. You know, show people how, that, it's, that it's not just for big buildings, it's not just for libraries, that it's things that they can do in their own lives to make a difference. Um, some programming ideas that I've come up with off the top of my head, there are libraries that are doing environmental film festivals. 
I mean, you could use Sustainability Book Club. There are a lot of great sustainability books out there. Um, I actually have developed a, a LibGuide um, of environmental novels, if you're interested in doing that also. Um, there's a link to that on the Green Library's LibGuide. Um, you could have a program making art from found, from found items or from recycled, recycled stuff. Have an art show displaying art from recycled materials and found items. Uh, there are a lot of artists doing really cool things. Um, Another thing you can do is um, show people how to do altered book art. I know several librarians who do really beautiful um, sculptures and stuff with, with, with old books. Um, have a series of green lifestyle or green business speakers. For example, local contractors who do green home building, renovation work, um, you know, companies that are companies in your area or businesses in your area that are, that are implementing sustainability projects, that kind of thing. Um, do displays of your sustainability books and DVDs. That's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, uh, low-hanging, you know, low-hanging fruit kind of way to to do some sustainability programming. Um, and then, you know, ask for ideas. Um, good ideas are out there everywhere. So the thought, the final thought that I want to leave you with today is a quote from Albert Einstein: "Setting an example is not the main means of influencing others; it is the only means." Librarians are seen as the knowledge experts in their organizations and in their communities, and libraries are seen as the place to go for information, hopefully, <laughs> in their community, which makes them perfect sustainability champions. So, I, you know, I, I think that libraries really have a role to play in sustainable communities, and hopefully now you do too. There is my contact information. There's finally the link to the... Um, again to the to where the presentation slides are and I will take any final questions and it doesn't look like there are any um, once once again the presentation slides are available on the Glipper website meetings page um, look for a follow-up email from me either later today or tomorrow it'll include a link to a feedback form it will also include a link to the presentation slides um, ho and hopefully to the webinar um, record the archived webinar recording if you want to share that with your colleagues who weren't able to participate today um, we'll also be posting the archived webinar to Glipper's YouTube channel in a week or two it depends on how long it takes to actually get the file converted um, so again thank you to everyone for joining us today and I hope you all have a great afternoon and if you have oh I have Let's see, I think I have one more question. Um, one person wanted to know how I get on board to utilities collaborative efforts for green libraries. I'm not sure what you mean by utilities. Are you if you're talking about like your local your local utility, um, I know in Illinois, I don't know where you're from, but I know in Illinois, um, both the, the two big ones are Ameren and ComEd, and they both have um, energy efficiency programs for, um, for individuals and for businesses. Um, and they are willing to be, um, are, are willing to, uh, to, provide, to provide assistance um, as well as, as other information. Um, and do I have a contact? Um, yeah, if you email me, we'll, we'll chat more offline. I think that's a good idea. And then um, somebody else points out that the 800-pound gorilla in the room is how to reduce by 50% CO2 emissions to slow their growth. That's, uh, that's a good question, and I think that's where libraries as sustainability leaders in their community come in because, you know, Libraries can make libraries make an impact, but if libraries can can make enough of an impact, um, or can can by example um, encourage other businesses and um, organizations in the community to implement sustainability projects, then I think you've really got something. Um, so that's I so I will leave you with that is is. Uh, you know how do how do we begin to reduce CO2 emissions by 50 percent? Um, and I think I think that's I think that's probably a topic for another day.